Good evening, book lovers. Mesdames et messieurs, bonsoir. Goede avond, vrienden van Passaporta. You have braved the rain to be here, thousands of you, to celebrate with us the fifth edition of the Passaporta Festival of Literature. Thank you for taking this time, for your attention and interest, and sharing this with more than 100 writers, critics, journalists, and artists over the past three evenings and a generous Sunday. Four days of reflection and dialogue on how literature is relevant for our time and how current events find their way into writing. Books need readers, but also places for readers to meet, to exchange ideas, to share the love for literature. This is what a Passaporta Festival stands for, and you, as a committed community of readers from different backgrounds, in different languages, responded to it so warmly. Before I give the floor to our invité d'honneur, Ian McEwen, I also wish to thank our sponsors and subsidizers, because by supporting the festival, they confirmed their belief in the power of words. Thank you to the numerous partners from Belgium and abroad who collaborated with us, not in the least Bozar, who has been hosting the festival's opening as well as the closing event. A heartfelt thank you to the interviewers, translators and writers who have accepted the festival's invitation to share their ideas with us as readers. And a huge appreciation of the whole Passaporta Festival team who strive to invest so much of their time, be it in programming, communication, or production, springs from them being book lovers. It's an absolute pleasure and a privilege to close the fifth edition of the Passaporta Festival with an onstage interview with one of Europe's most prominent writers. Thank you so much, Mr. McEwing, for having accepted our invitation to meet your Belgian and European readers here in Brussels. Ladies and gentlemen, Ian McEwen and Annelies Beck. A very good evening to all of you and to you, Mr. McEwen. All these people weathered the storm to be here. They're all weathered, if that's a word in English. I'm deeply honored. <laughs> You've been here for two days in Brussels. Yes. Um, if I'm informed correctly, it was the first time that you actually stopped in Brussels and it took is, a look around. It is the first time, yes. Yes. What did you make of it? Well, first impression... Except for rainy. Oh, I knew you... I should have thought you were going to ask me this. Uh, some of the most beautiful streets and buildings I've seen in a major city and some of the ugliest. <laughs> now we believe every word you but say. But more of the former than the latter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It's a great honor and a pleasure to have you here. Um, we'll be discussing um, your work, obviously, your um, ideas about the now and then, the theme of the Passaporta Festival. But let's start with your most recent novel, mm -hmm. The Children Act. Maybe a very simple question. What is the Children Act? The Children Act is a piece of legislation. It's been revised many times in Britain, and it has, I think, its equivalents in many uh, Western democracies. Basically, it defines and defends the rights of children. And its first sentence is that in any matter concerning children, the courts, the judges, must put the interests of the children first. Now, that sounds like a tautology, but it means that the interests of the children are greater than the interests of that child's parents, or its religion, or the social workers, or anyone else around it. So that means that judges are free to define what those interests are, so it leaves the matter open, but it has to put the child at the center. So children cease to become simply the possession of their parents. Mm -hmm. uh, 
It was, it was passed in 1989, in the days of Mrs. Thatcher, who um, was famous for hating social workers who wrote this legislation. I don't think she took any interest in it, actually. It, it just went through. It's been revised many times. It's, as, I think, a very civilized document. But part of the trouble is that we are now going through, and I know you've had this in Belgium too, that we're going through a nightmare of introspection about various institutional abuses, sexual abuses of children. Yeah, the case of Jimmy Savile. Um... Savile, yeah. Uh, it's really thrown us into a, a, a terrible dark space. So it's not a self-evident um, no. well, act, it, or this, not to be yeah. implemented in This can only defend way. children when it comes to court. It mm -hmm. can't defend them, so it tries to defend them in institutions, but clearly, in many respects, it's failed. You yeah. know, we, we obviously have to, to think harder and think again. In the novel, um, the main character is Fiona. She's a judge, and she has to decide um, on a number of uh, cases, clearly. Um, but the main case is the one about a minor, a boy, Adam, who needs life-saving treatment, but he refuses, and his parents refuse on the grounds, on religious grounds. They're yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah, Jehovah's Witnesses will not accept blood transfusions. Uh, I suppose this is the one thing we all know about them. Um, that's simple enough for the courts. Usually what happens, a child needs blood, the hospital applies to the court, the parents are refusing on behalf of the child, you cannot treat someone without their permission or their parents' permission. So the hospital applies to the courts and the courts generally rule in favor of treating the child. But when that child gets to almost 18, it becomes a little more difficult. Uh, I was fortunate, I mean, I like researching novels uh, and uh, this is the one case when the research would ring my bell. Um, there Literally. Are not uh, there are not many people left on the planet Earth who have not gone to their front door to answer to some Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, I think, you know, we are a, dimi a very diminishing number of people who have not. The only people who haven't are people who don't have a front door. <laughs> and so I've, I've said to them, look, I'm writing a novel about, about your religion and tell me if you had a child that was sick and needed a blood transfusion and it was life-saving, would you refuse it? And in each case, they said, yes, we would refuse it. And I said, well, this would generally shock most people that you would make your child a martyr to your religion and let that child die. And one of them said, and it really haunted me, he said, well, that's because you have a different view of death. For you, death is the end. For us, death is the beginning. And I felt then uh, the full sincerity of this belief, but also the huge gulf that separated us. Mm -hmm. These are two kinds of logic, almost. Yeah. And you explore how and if they can be bridged or how they can connect in a novel, I think. I don't think way. they can be bridged, actually. I think, hmm? well, there's, you're dead or you're not dead. I mean, really. Um, That's pretty black or white. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there might be some intermediate stages, but I yet to learn about them. <laughs> um, but I mean, but, in the book, for example, yeah. Fiona, the judge, goes to the bedside of this sick boy yeah. and talks to him and tries to understand yeah. where his conviction comes from, what he really believes, and they not only talk, but they sing together, they read poetry. Yep. Is that some kind of trying to bridge the gap? She doesn't embark on this uh, in any other way than the fact that she is somewhat driven by some troubles in her own life. Her husband is leaving her after 35 years of marriage. She's a childless woman who feels that she's given so much to the law, and yet she's feel bad and, and a longing that she never took the time off to have children. 
And she sees in this boy that possibly the child she never had. The young man is very bright, highly articulate, knows, has a firm grip on all the religious principles uh, of the Jehovah's Witness, and is absolutely determined. And Fiona the judge knows full well that this is a gray area. How much power do we give the state over a freely exercised conscience? Um, if that child was 18, or any age above 18, uh, the state would have to hold up its hands and say, well, look, if you want to die, we cannot stop you because it's a fundamental right and a very important human right that you cannot treat someone against their will. Mm -hmm. So this is the gray area, and, and courts often in Children Act matters will allow a bit of lack, uh, a flexibility, you know, that, that it's not just on the moment of your birthday, it's whether you are uh, rational and understand exactly what you face. So it is a difficult matter. I don't take a sort of hard-line secular view on this, although I think you know, if I was in Fiona's place, I would probably deliver the same judgment in the end. But it's what's called, and this is a rather nice phrase in English that I learned when I was talking to a, a judge, it's an anxious matter. An anxious matter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one where the law is worried uh, that it mustn't rush in too easily to say, um, hospital treat this child, this is all a load of nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's not too clear cut. It's not too clear cut. Yeah. Without uh, giving uh, anything away, at, at some point Fiona um, considers whether or not she can offer something in religion's place, meaning. Mm. Um, that, that is a question or a, a, um, a thought that has some resonance with what's going on today with lots of young people mm. um, going to Syria yeah. in the name of religion, of pure religion. Was that on your mind while you were writing it? Not specifically, but um, broadly, if you consider the Jehovah's Witnesses as, a, as, a, as a, a kind of case, a general case of religion, what it offered was a very tight community, um, a very specific set of moral, uh, a moral compass, if you like. Um, the meeting with the judge has a profound effect upon the boy. He, he sees for the first time, or hears for the first time, what neutral, open-ended inquiry would be like, rather than dogma. And it has a huge impact on him, and he begins to move away from his religion. But what's gonna go in its place? And is it the duty of the judge to provide something in its mm -hmm. place? She turns away, tragically, she turns away. She protects herself against his need. And again, um, if you ask yourself, well, what does uh, devotion to violent jihadism or whatever offer? Well, certainly ethical, moral certainty is one part of it. Mm -hmm. And the conditions of modernity, the ones that actually I love, are precisely the opposite. Openness, doubt, uh, the exchange of ideas, the way they shift, uh, Etc. Uh, but for many people, uh, that feels like swimming in a in a bottomless sea. Um, although we don't excuse the killing of other people, we, we 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 should try and understand what it is to want this moral certainty, these specifics. And I guess that's what all religions offer. Mm -hmm. A clear-cut framework mm. in which you can live your life, operate, um, and but knowing that you're always watched. Yes. By some supernatural entity, mm -hmm. and that you will be judged, and that you're a good person, and you will arrive. You know, I suppose you know th this opens up a whole interesting idea of the historical role of one of the worst ideas I think that the humans have had is utopia. One of the worst ideas. It is. Why? If you think that you could make all of humankind happy forever 
what would it matter if you killed 100 million people to get there? It's an easy price to pay. So it's a speak. small price to pay if you enter the peaceable kingdom. And we saw it in the Soviet experiment, um, the wiping out of the past, the clean slate. We saw it with Pol Pot. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen it in, in all kinds of utopian, they often are very savage. They're ruthless because it's only rational if you know you have the answer to human society and how it should be organized, that you wipe out the opposition. So uh, I think that's part of, you know, part of the problem here. We see yet another, we had it in, in, the, in the late Middle Ages, between the 11th and 15th centuries, bands of uh, crazed Christians of a utopian kind, slaughtering Jews and bourgeois and priests. Um, right across the North German plain. Mm -hmm. um, certain that the world was about to end and the second coming was about to happen. Uh, it's, a, it's a savage idea. It's surprising that we're back with it. Yeah. You know, uh, it's a long way since the Middle Ages. But what does that say about a secular um, world or secular, wo secular world view with all its uh, technology technology and all its bright and enlightened idea, if it has no answer, of nothing to offer, apparently, that it doesn't weigh up against this utopian ideal that yeah, fuels so many young people and yeah. humans in general, uh, century after century. I know he's vilified now, but I think Fukuyama, when he wrote The End of History, that very influential piece. After the fall of the wall. After the fall of the wall. I think there was a quarter truth in the idea that an open liberal democracy is probably the least bad human organization that we're going to find. It's the most religiously tolerant. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say religiously, I mean that also atheists have to be, atheists have to have respect too. You know? um, not just the religious. Even for people who are religious. Is what you're saying? I'd say only the secular society can grant religious tolerance. If you leave, if you leave it in the hands of one religion, you know, it'll be disaster for all the rest. Uh, it's no longer the case with Christianity, but it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, look at the, how Europe suffered the clash between uh, Catholicism and Protestantism over tiny issues of, you know, of dogma armies slaughtering each other on an unbelievable scale. Seven years, 30 years war. So um, I think you would probably find that the sum of human happiness is greater in an open society in which you have fixed in law tolerance for a whole range of ideas. The, the price you pay for that is that you're not offering any certainties. But that is the price you have to pay. And that you can be educated in, or that you can be taught to live with the uncertainty? Yes, I mean, I'm sometimes asked, do I approve of uh, religion being taught in schools? My answer to that is yes, as long as you teach several religions. Mm -hmm. Teaching one is a bad idea. You've said um, the tradition of the novel I work in is fundamentally secular, a form that is plural. Yeah. So is that what the novel and the novelist can contribute to society and... Yes, I think the novel is born of, of the Enlightenment. It's a fairly relatively new form. Its growth, we saw, was in the 18th century. Um, there are religious novelists. It's quite hard to write a novel and write a part for God because once you have a deus ex machina, uh, you're no longer free, you can deliver your characters any way you like. And I always thought Graham Greene, who sat on this stage, I gather, mm -hmm. some years ago, I thought always Graham Greene had this problem, that whenever he allowed the supernatural in the form of a Catholic God to intervene in his plot, it fell apart. The plausibility just drains away. And I think the novel is largely a, is, is a secular form in which the novelist plays God. Yeah, I was just going to ask, isn't 
That's what a novelist does. Yeah, so the novelist takes the position of God and allows many voices. And it's a great device, the novel, for entering the minds of, of other people and entering them in a neutral state of mind. So you could enter the mind of the darkest villain, um, as indeed Shakespeare does in, in Macbeth and many other tragedies, but get right inside. And it's plural in mm -hmm. that sense. You can have many characters contending. Um, it doesn't necessarily need a contest between the good and the bad. You can see how ordinary people can do terrible things too. And we've seen this in, in many modern wars in which neighbors who've lived peacefully beside each other, Rwanda, Bosnia, can turn on each other and do terrible things. It's a question um, that was asked earlier today. What um, does the novel do that any good, thorough, long read, good reporting, well written, cannot do? Like reportage, you mean? Yes, yeah. for example, on, on mm. an, uh, a current theme. Mm. Sometimes reportage does borrow, by the way, some of the conventions of the novel. But I think what it can't do is enter the minds of others. I think that, that is the crucial trick of the novel. It's, it's characterization. And I would say that we watched those conventions being brought to great beauty and sophistication in the 19th century, in the novels of Jane Austen, Tolstoy, Flaubert. I mean, the, the list is endless. But the conventions of character, of delving into character, of occupying character, being someone else, uh, was brought to a very high point. And we stand on those shoulders. And however marvelous, and I think it was marvelous, the aesthetic revolution of modernism was, if we can hold all the best tricks of modernism, including uh, its tricks with consciousness, and yet at the same time still remember what the 19th century did with character, then we're in a very privileged place. Mm -hmm. And then the possibilities are endless, no limitations, um, like Salman Rushdie writes in Joseph Anton, um, I quote, were there no limits to the shamelessness of the literary imagination? No, there were no limits. Agree? Well, I'm never going to write a novel about golf. About <laughs> golf. golf. <laughs> okay, that's your self-imposed limitation. Someone then. else will. <laughs> uh, well, someone else has. John Updike has written very well on golf. Um, and I always have to remind myself that Bob Dylan plays golf, which is a very difficult matter for me. Um, <laughs> No, no limits, no limits. Yep. Um, I suppose if someone wrote a novel that incited hatred for another group, then I would say that's crossed the limit. Mm -hmm. but, but it's not generally the instinct of the novel to do that. Yeah. Of course, um, your first novels, um, I'm thinking of The Cement Garden as well, that's where you explored perversity. Uh, in people, between people, in people's minds. Um, it has been said that over the years you've broadened your scope, you've um, changed from the look inside of people more towards the world around them and in which they interact. Would you agree with that description? Have you broadened um, your scope or well, I, changed the point of view? I've changed my point of view in, in that I, I was a very timid despite what you say, uh, and I did write about savage, dark, terrible things, I was also a very timid writer mm. in that I just kept to the inside of people and only but slowly... But people who killed, who Yeah, who did the most terrible or... things. And don't ask me where they came from, I don't know. Um, where did they come from? <laughs> did it come from? I must have read them in... Okay someone else's novel, I don't know. Um, and only slowly did I get the build on the courage to, to get warmer and more expansive. But I still, you know, the most recent novel still lives largely in the mind of a judge. Yeah, but you needed um, courage to become warmer? I lived 
uh, I started as a novelist in the 70s with a handicap of a, of a general aesthetic, which only now as it recedes in the past do I see it as, it was like wearing a lead jacket. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of existential writing that um, I think I still see it around, in, especially on mainland Europe, where it's considered that uh, to address the everyday or to name the city or to really get involved in what's happening now is considered rather low. And the, you, Too the, mundane. Sorry. Yes, that's for journalists. And you've got to sort of float above and you just deal in a world of the sublime or the ironic or, or whatever. Um, and I was helped a little along the way by the writing of Kafka. Mm -hmm. I liked the way that then that Kafka's writing seemed to belong to nowhere. Now when I read it, it looks like Prague to me. Uh, it looks very specific, but at the time I took a different lesson from it. So uh, I started with this handicap of saying that I, will no, I won't ever write a sentence like she thought. I would only do on the page what people said and what they did. I would never allow the interior. And maybe I was influenced a little by Rob Grier, Le Nouveau Roman, mm -hmm. which only gave you a kind of behaviorist view of of people. And it took me a while to shake that off. Um, so yes, uh, slowly I became more interested in the present and in history and then in music and science and the conflict between reason and faith and, and many other things besides. Yeah. You've said the pleasure principle is often overlooked by critics, for example. Um, and the way you write, uh, or you have your characters um, do their jobs, mm. I'm thinking of Henry and Saturday, but also this judge writing her judgment and mm. working on her texts um, are, are very, often it's linked to absorption, to, to concentration. Um, and Zadie Smith has once remarked, it's, it's uh, very much how I experience the writing process at its best. Are you always mm. writing about writing? I think all writing is, is, is to some extent that, but we mustn't let ourselves be trapped mm -hmm. in that notion. Um, but this abs yeah. absorption, is that also part of the pleasure of writing for you? I think it's part of the pleasure of life. And we don't have a good word for this in English. Um, but think of the times when you are so absorbed in a task, uh, and it's difficult, uh, sometimes it requires collaboration with others, and you achieve it. You don't feel the sort of joy uh, you might associate with sex or skiing or eating, but it's one of the greatest pleasures in life. Uh, and that's why I think I've been interested in writing about people's work, finding out about the specificities of being a brain surgeon or an evolutionary psychologist um, or a judge or whatever. Uh, not only does it throw up language possibilities, but also just that concentration that delivers us into... Well, I mean, we get it in a game of tennis, you might get it on a hike, but I think you get it most when it's a difficult task that removes you, if we can just touch on the theme of this, um, this year's uh, conference, the Literary Festival. It removes you out of time. Mm -hmm. Or you could see it as delivering you totally into the now. You know, uh, no past, no future, you are just the task. And I think that writers, often on, in sort of forums like this, want to persuade people that their life is one long agony of creation, but they're lying. Um, there, of course there are agonies of creation, but there's also a pleasure principle. That morning when suddenly 700 words fall down on the page uh, and you, 
you don't even know you exist as you put them there. Those, they belong in that general uh, category of, of human happiness that needs more definition, need, needs a word. I mean, one psychologist called it flow, as in a river. I don't think that's quite there. Not, not but we are all in pursuit of these, and maybe it comes 10 times a year for some writers, maybe it's once a year for mm -hmm. others, uh, but it's bliss. Um, but it's a quiet bliss. It's not, um, you don't hear Mahler, you know, or, you know. Um, no, no exuberance no. there, no. It's, it's one of the great pleasures of life. Mm -hmm. in, in the book, um, children, the children act, uh, Fiona is also a musician. She, she plays the piano. She cannot do jazz, though. She plays jazz like Debussy. She makes it sound like Debussy. Mm. But um, she's, she's very concentrated. Uh, and she, you, you write, at a certain point, there is the, the horizonless hyperspace of music making, beyond time and purpose. I was wondering, you mentioned uh, earlier that you like research. Mm. Are you a musician yourself? Do you play music at all? I, I played the flute badly for about 25 years. Okay, 25 years yeah, badly. Yeah, that's a long time to play the flute badly. <laughs> <laughs> that's an achievement um, in itself, I'd say. Yeah, but, um, no medals. So yeah. how do you go about, because the book is, is full of references to music, and mm. not only this one, not only this novel, but especially this one, I think. You, you write about how she works on, on getting the music right. She's, she's working towards a performance with a colleague. Um, how can you research a thing like that? Well, I'm a listener, so uh, uh, you should listen to me listen. Um, this I can do. Um, and I have written about composers, I mean, in a novel called Amsterdam. I suppose that novelists, writers generally, I, I, I think that we, we rather long for that liberation into abstraction that composers have. Hmm. Music is like, um, there's a lovely poem, untypical poem by Philip Larkin about the spring. This is a good time to hear it. And its first line is, the trees are coming into leaf like something almost being said. And I always think that's a great definition of music. It's like something almost being said. You th it, it seems rich with meaning, but you don't even know what it is. Uh, and of course, if it's familiar and it haunts you from the past, or you know, there's, there's all that. But it's that abstraction mm. that I think that those of us who have to name the world in a sentence uh, have a kind of longing for. Um, I've written uh, an opera libretto, which we, uh, was performed about three years ago. Michael Barclay was the composer. And I suppose that was my attempt. But again, it never did it. I mean, because I had to write exactly what was being said, and, but he had all the freedom of, um, of the music. Uh, and by the way, the librettist is, is a low form of life. Um, <laughs> It's down there with the screenplay writer. You know, you, <laughs> you, you abandon all pretense of being God. You, you become like a private soldier in a large army. And yet, I, if I'm, if I, if I'm uh, informed correctly, you are working on a screenplay based on the Children Act. Yes. So there uh, you are, poor and soldier. I'm, yes, and it's a real demotion in life. <laughs> Uh, and it's good for you, really. It's good for me, anyway. Um, Can you tell us more about it? Who's going to turn this into a movie, or are um, you going to...? The director w will be Richard Eyre, who's a very well-known theatre director. But, but years ago, we made a film together called The Ploughman's Lunch, mm -hmm. uh, set at the time of the Falklands War. And ever since, we said we would work together again, and a lifetime has gone by. So this was 1981. Um, we're close friends, and every time we finish an evening, we say, we must do something together. Uh, and so 35 years have drifted by. So now I'm determined we will make this film together. And so you are actually rewriting your own novel, in yeah. a way. 
Yeah. How hard is that? It's quite pleasant, actually. The, the, the best bits are where you find a way of doing something different. Mm. And the most boring bits are where you can see no escape from the scene that's in the novel. You, know, you have to just type it out, and that's boring. So finding ways to, to turn another idea, something fluid, some way of um, enfolding something or a quick way through. I mean, if you take an average novel, a, you know, 90,000 words, 100,000 words, a screenplay is about 20,000. And here you really are in an existential world because it's only what people say and do. That's all you've got. So you're back to square one, back, back to, to how one. you started. Back to that bleak existential world. And then you must rely on your actors to project an inner mm. life. I want to talk about you as a character for a moment. Um, you have recently given, sold your archive to an institution in uh, Austin. To Texas. the Harry Ransom Center of the University of Texas, Austin. How does it make you feel? Well, actually, this is a bit like being almost dead. Mm -hmm. um, actually, uh, do they pay you? Yes. I mean, why else would I do it? I uh, wondered about that. <laughs> yeah. No, they paid very handsomely, and I thought, you know, I'm 67 in a few months' time. You never know when you're going to dry up. You mean as a writer? You, as a writer. You're worried about that? that Not now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yes, I am. Of course I am. Uh, it's bound to happen. I mean, you know, it's going to happen. We're all going to dry up. Um, Running they, out of ideas is what you mean. This doing, one thing is sure. You know, um, there are not many good novels written by novelists over the age of 80. Not many. No, but I mean, maybe just because people didn't live that long, mm. and now now they're yeah. living longer. Okay, but that still gives it just puts the half life, if we can call it that, just puts it later. Mm. So somehow you've still got to pay the rent. No one lets you off the rent, as it were, uh, just because you're 85. Um, so. Uh, so there's that, yeah, but also, there is that. Anyway, that's what, what, what is important, what, um, why does your archive, no disrespect intended, mm. need to be preserved? What will it teach the next generations? What will, what's the mm. legacy? It's a very good question. Um, um, I well, mean, ju just to, I, I browsed okay. through some Let, of the documents. There are photographs, letters to your yeah, children. Yeah, letters to my children. Doodles uh, for your um, children. Well, manuscripts. When I'm writing a novel, uh, I work out ideas in longhand in a large green notebook. So, uh, a great deal of all the things that never ended up in the novel, and many of the things that did are there. So if, if there are scholars who want to know how a novel got written, uh, there is that story. There is a kind of meta story of, uh, of that. Uh, I've just read the volume one of a huge biography of the American novelist Saul Bellow, um, and like all literary biographies, the one task is to f try and find out what is the relationship between the life and the work. Mm -hmm. And with some writers, it's, it's almost one-on-one. -on -one. The life just tips itself into the novels. But then there are novelists, that, so that's the bellow end of it. His life, his divorces, everybody, the, his wife's lawyer, well, they all get put in the novel. Who would you have at the other end? Uh, Calvino, mm -hmm. you know, where we don't get um, every last aspect of the novel. Or, you know, I think it, it's a game to play. Everyone is on that spectrum somewhere. And where are you on that scale? Because you have mm. been um, broadly and deeply profiled, for example, in The New Yorker, mm. at various stages of your life. Um, your personal life was all over the papers. Mm. A long-lost brother found, mm. a divorce, 
um, yet you strike me as a rather private person, so... Mm. I, I'd like to feel I was more in Calvino's camp than Saul Bellow's. Mm -hmm. But it's impossible. Uh, Kingsley Amis, the uh, English novelist now dead, uh, said that no, no person can write 500 words of prose without revealing something about themselves. And it's true uh, that if you write novels, you might not be writing about uh, your divorce or your long lost brother, but your very style of being is going to inform the novel and tiny things. People who know me well, especially my family, uh, often say when they're reading my novel that they see all kinds of things that they know, you know, where I got that from or... Uh, so that's all... The, in other words, your, your fingerprints are all over it. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Calvino's wife, Mrs. Calvino, <laughs> would say the same. So you might be reading The Baron in the Trees or Cosme comics, but she would be seeing, ah, oh, yes, of course, I know where that came from. So although we're on that spectrum and s some writers disguise their tracks uh, more than others, uh, finally, you know, there is a relation and biographers are hungry to establish it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the point. Yeah. So my archive will be uh, in some, um, and eventually they have my notebooks. So there will be a, a kind of more of a, a linear account of that. Um, so that's why they want them. Do you like olives? Yes, why? It's in the book, the children act. You right, describe at various yeah. times what people eat. And I mean, all of your books are full of lovely details about um, what is the things that are around people, that, that shape their life or their environment, um, the reality of it, the, yeah, the way it shapes their lives. That's, that's used. Does that say something about your character or your personality? That's well, I suppose the, the, what I like in, in other writers uh, is the world of things, but of course, you know, the world of things as it must be through the world of people. Uh, I like it in poetry too. Um, how, uh, yeah, how to say this? In movies, the thing I like is when a director and a cameraman can generate for you the thinginess of the world. And it often involves a, a lovely use of close up and then medium shots and then close up again. That sense of doors and plates and hand on shoulders and all the rest of it. I like that. Uh, recreating it in the novel has to be a, a matter of pure artifice. You're only, you can't give us the whole world of things, but you can select certain details that create the impression of a whole world of things. That, that's what I You said you worry somewhat in the back of your mind about lack of inspiration, perhaps in the future, apart from the screenplay. Can you tell us what you are working on or will be working on next? No. Um, <laughs> Um, I am writing on something, it's, it seems so crazy uh, that I daren't tell you, uh, even if we were sitting alone. Uh, and, and anyway, like, like many, many writers, uh, to speak too soon, to start putting words around something before you've quite defined it is, well, is bad luck, I'd say. Okay. Um, Let's not go there then. No. But you did tell me before that you are very interested in all the things that are going on, that you're excited by all that's going on in, in areas like technology, science, mm -hmm. the arts as well. So mm. it seems to me that 
your work is cut out for you for the next decades? I think the, those of us who, let's say, to take an arbitrary point in life, let's call it uh, your 60th birthday or your 55th, the measure I think you have to take is to check in with yourself about your curiosity. And if your curiosity about life starts to diminish, then you're in trouble. And it's curiosity that will keep us in the world. And curiosity is the drive, I think, to write a novel. Not only that, I, I love to quote this all the time because it seems so self-evident, but Henry James wrote a famous essay about fiction in which he said, the first duty of the novelist is to be interesting. Now, I know that begs a very big question you know, of what you think is interesting. But I think that, to turn that round, if a reader is not curious about the first 25 pages of a novel, that reader is either going to desert you uh, or that reader is going to have a very bad time. And think of all the times, especially when we were school children, especially when we were teenagers, when we had to read things because they were good for us. But, but they promoted no curiosity in us. Uh, how nice it is to be liberated, how to be, not to be at school anymore is a wonderful thing. Um, to read things because you think they're good for you is one of the most terrible things to do. So, uh, interest, curiosity, that seems to me the lifeblood, not only for writers, but for readers too. Ian McEwen, I wish you a lot of curiosity, <laughs> an, an intense curiosity for the years to come. Time flew by. This is all the time we've got for this conversation. Before you put your hands together, I want to tell you that Mr. McEwen is so kind as to uh, sign copies of his book, one copy per person. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, one book, I mean, not one copy of each of your books, yeah. one book. I want and, my breakfast before I leave. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think there will be people with post-it notes, so you can put your name on a post-it note and make it easier uh, for you to have your name in the book. Mr. McEwen, it was a Pleasure and an honor to have you here. I thank you very, very much. Thank you, Annalise. On behalf of thank all you. of us. Thank you. Thank you. I follow you.